And and you guys have a uh, a record of of even going beyond that, you know, those defensive measures and and trying to provide that space. Um, my understanding is in the wake of uh, Charlottesville, uh, your union also organized against uh, Richard Spencer uh, coming into uh, I guess it was was it Gainesville. Uh, t- tell us about that. Thank you for reminding me because I think that that mobilization is really a part of, of the crisis that we're in now. And so Richard Spencer um, is a neo-Nazi, um, it, as, as some of your viewers may know. Um, he's a person who advocates um, ethnic cleansing, uh, which is de facto genocide. You can't have ethnic cleansing in the modern world without using violence. And so when he, and he has followers and people who aren't necessarily members members of his organization but people that were following him on these college tours. And so during Charlottesville, many of us remember the, the violence that took place there, the, the Spencer followers with their tea torches, marching through residential neighborhoods in Charlottesville, chanting, Jews will not replace us, another hateful anti-Semitic and racist chants. So in Gainesville, we decided we weren't going to, to, to put up with that. And so the union really mobilized in advance. We sponsored and co-sponsored teach-ins to try to bring into focus intersectionality. And this is another thing that the state of Florida hates for us to talk about. That's a code term that they hate. But we use it to talk about the connections between anti-Semitism, racism, homophobia, uh, and, and many forms of oppression that Richard Spencer was supporting. And so we actually uh, were able to, as a union, to be part of this great alliance of Jewish students, Muslim students, Christians, atheists, you know, you name it. It was kind of an all, it was a great Heinz 57 kind of coalition. And we're very proud of the fact that we retired Richard Spencer uh, about a week or so after he, his failed trip to Gainesville and none of his followers came marching through our neighborhoods with tiki torches because we told them in advance, you're not gonna do that. And again, it gets back to what you were saying earlier, the social justice unionism part of our work. We're not just about what happens in the workplace. Do we have collective bargaining contracts? Yes. Do we have a grievance procedure? Yes. And those are very important for us. But equally important was keeping Richard Spencer's fascist followers from marching through our neighborhoods with their torches and and assault rifles. So we retired him and, and and he said a week or two after he said, it's just not fun anymore. I'm going to stop doing it. And so we're very proud of that. But again, we faced a lot of retaliation for that. The state of Florida didn't like it. Our administration didn't like it. They wanted us to ignore this man and his, his minions coming through. But we said, we're not going to ignore it because our students really wanted us to step up. You know, it's, it's like our, our students are saying, if you have if you if you have fascism and it's staring you at the face, what are you going to do? Like look the other way, and we just can't do that. Uh, explain to me from uh, I mean uh, how this sort of embrace of intersectionality, uh, how this strengthens unions and the labor movement. Well. Let me start by talking about why the state doesn't like us talking about intersectionality, because it does exactly that. When we when I see my interests is connected to yours and and into my neighbors and I I begin to understand that unless my neighbor is secure, I'm not very secure until I begin to understand that, you know, until my my Jewish colleagues feel safe and have a feel they have a supportive environment. Um, Until I understand those things, um, I'm not really in a safe and supportive environment. And intersectionality is simply understanding the unity of of a democratic society. You can't have a democratic society unless all people are free and equal. Um, If you don't have that, then you have an oppressive society. And so on the one level, that's one kind of baseline notion of intersectionality. So if you're talking about workplace discrimination, Sure, you can you, you can focus on one group because that might be your expertise. Let's just say you focus on you know anti Chinese discrimination in the workplace. Okay, there's a whole literature on that, and, and it's very important to specialize in that. But unless you understand the connections between that form of discrimination and sexist discrimination in the workplace, and the discrimination against Black workers in the workplace, and the discrimination against 
all workers, then you're not really getting the whole picture. That's simply the overview of what intersectionality is. The opposite viewpoint is that we're isolated, alienated individuals, that your freedom has nothing to do with my freedom, that we're all just kind of working kind of in a vacuum. Uh, and that's what the state of Florida wants us to see now, because that really keeps us disempowered. It keeps us away from each other. Uh, an intersectional attitude uh, leads to organizing. It leads to understanding that the state of Florida or even the United States doesn't give us rights. We earn those rights, uh, but we can only earn those rights through organizing. Uh, lastly, is there anything you can tell us that would give us any type of optimism for Florida in any time frame that you choose? <laughs> That's a great question. Well, we're holding the line. I think the optimism is that, you know, you mentioned the, the Richard Spencer thing earlier when, when the state passed the ban on AP African-American studies last February, we mobilized statewide. And again, the unions mobilized with the students. We had really wonderful teach-ins, you know, three hour teach-ins. Can you imagine college students sitting in a classroom for three hours reading and, and listening to lectures and having fun doing it? Um, we're Being the father of a college student, my answer is no. And also <laughs> having been a college student, my answer is no. I know, I was so excited. I mean, we have students here in high schools walking out in, in response to the book banning. And, and you won't hear a lot about it, you won't see a lot about it, because it kind of frankly terrifies adults. But I think that's that's the optimism, is the younger people, the college, the high school, the middle school students, uh, the parents in Florida are starting to mobilize too. They're starting to really say, uh, okay, well really, why do you want to ban Kurt Vonnegut's Slaughterhouse-Five? Is it really because there is sex in the book or is it because the book is anti-war? Because um, you know we, we've seen that before. So there's a lot of cause for optimism. I think um, we, we just have to hold our unions together and um, the last thing I'll mention along that is, you know, if, if, if you're in a play, if you're watching this now and it looks like, oh, my gosh, Florida is terrible. I'm so glad I don't live there. Um, don't do that because it's coming your way yeah. because this model of divide and conquer uh, that Ron DeSantis is brilliant at doing. Now, he may he may have lost his presidential bid. But that ideology of dividing us, of getting me to distrust you, of getting you to distrust me that's that's his bread and butter and and that that's a politics which unfortunately continues to resonate paul ortiz professor of history at the university of florida thanks so much for your time today really appreciate it thank you so much for having me on the majority report it's been a great honor thank, thank you. you paul happy new, yeah, happy new year happy, happy new, new year, year.